Okay, let's get started with today's lecture. Uh, today, I want to continue talking a little bit about qualitative research and about interviews as we started it the last time. And I remember last time I showed you examples of, of an interview going, going wrong and the same interview going, going much better. So uh, today we'll pick up on that and we'll talk a little bit about what are the purposes of doing interviews and what can you actually get out of that and what do you need to think about um, or what you should think about. Um, then I want to very briefly talk about focus groups, so not too much, I just talk a little bit about that. And, uh, and then maybe for this second half of the lecture I want to talk about ethnographies. And there we go a little in more detail. But before we start, you know, I have a couple of announcements as well. Uh, unfortunately on Monday I won't be around. Oh. So I won't be able to come to the coffee morning or tea morning, whatever. <laughs> Uh, however, um, somebody else is going to take over the lecture. So we're going to have a guest lecturer. And we have Charis Tatum. Charis is uh, a PhD student, so he's actually my PhD student. And uh, he, uh, I'm very sure he'll do an excellent job. So don't give him a too hard time, you know. Uh, but Charis is going to uh, give the lecture next week so that you don't freak out about what the hell is this guy doing there in front. Of you. So Travis is going to talk about the lecture and everything that Travis will talk about will be equally important for the exam as well. Yeah? So it's not that this is not relevant. Actually it is relevant. Everything that is happening in the lecture is relevant. And Travis is not going to talk about anything else than I wouldn't talk about either. Yeah? So I, I, I talk with him very, very detail about what the lecture is going to be about. So everything that he will, he will mention is going to be relevant for the exam. So in that context, well, it's still a bit of time, you know, I don't know, no, no reason to freak out yet, but it always helps to, you know, because you want to avoid freaking out at the end of the day, and this can so easily happen. Uh, at some point the term is over, and at some point you realize you have tons of exams to write, and you don't know what to do. Yeah. So the exam is coming up at some point, I don't have the date yet, but I'm going to keep you informed about that. However, what I did so far, I prepared an exam preparation guide. So that is on Blackboard right now. It's just on the syllabus, you see it, just look through. And in there, I outline what I expect from you. There I outline how you should prepare for this exam. So that's actually why I'm saying this now, because I don't know, at the end, when it's kind of, I don't know, before the exam, the time is done, right? So now I actually read through this exam preparation guide. There I give you some advice on how to prepare for the exam. And as I told you at the beginning of the term, if you do what I tell you, you do very well in the exam. It is hard work, but you do well in the exam. So that's sort of where the exam preparation guide comes into play. So check it out. It's very useful. It's very useful. Okay, so let's get started with the lecture today. Uh, I briefly come back on interviews a little bit, uh, just to put it in context again, because then I want to talk about three purposes, about three different ways how we can use interviews, or how people think about interviews, and then afterwards I move on into focus groups and ethnographies, and these are the things in the context of ethnographies that I want to talk about. So we have a bunch of material today. So interviews. Well, I introduced this whole idea of qualitative research the last time. Uh, remember here the idea is that maybe some of the things we cannot measure that well. Maybe some things are hard to put a number on them. And there's this whole branch of qualitative research that comes into play that uses things like qualitative interviews or focus groups or ethnographies. And you'll see later on what that means. So it's almost like partisan observations and so on. Uh, these are sort of ways to, uh, to, um, to get hold of these things that are difficult to put, to put in numbers. So what you try to do here, you try to be deep, you really try to go down and understand what is, what is happening. Yeah? You really probe in. You keep asking them about, okay, what are their experiences about this? Or, or I don't know, or what did that stress them out? Or all those kind of things, you know, as you saw in the little video that we, that we watched the last time. However, one thing you really need to keep in mind, when you do these kind of things, when you do qualitative research, you can hardly generalize to the larger population. Right? So that's sort of like the downside. That's sort of like the trade-off that we have here right now. Yeah. On the one side, uh, we can really dig deep, but then I only know something about these particular individuals that I interview. Yeah. 
maybe you have a completely different experience about your driving test than the person in the interview. And I could go out and maybe I could interview 10 people or maybe I could interview 20 people. But I won't be able to say anything about the Irish population at large. So this is a limitation. This is a serious limitation of this qualitative research. However, you dig deep in and you find out stuff that you might not find out when you go wide. So the alternative to it, and that's sort of where Travis is going to kick it off um, next week, and, and I will continue talking about that. And that's sort of where we use sampling, where we try to generalize from observations that we have. I hand out a survey to you, and then you fill it out, and based on that, I kind of try to generalize to the student population at UCD, or to the young generation island. You know, that's a generalization, and there sampling comes into play, and uh, you know, you can be, can be incredibly powerful. So, um, and we will talk about that next week. You know, when you see these election exit polls, you know, they interview uh, a few hundred people or a few thousand people, and actually they are super accurate to the whole population. Yeah? So they generalize. But with qualitative research, you cannot do that. That's a limitation. That's a limitation that you need to keep in mind. And the big mistake sometimes people do that they they conduct 10 interviews or 15 interviews, and then they then they pretend as if this is a representation of the general population. You can't do that. But you can do other things. Yeah, you can dig in and you can try to learn more about what's actually happening, or you can you can learn more about uh, uh, understanding. Okay, so I introduced interviews, qualitative interviews. Uh, it's basically a set of topics you know, that are being discussed rather than uh, in a standardized format with standardized questions. Uh, they are less structured. Uh, they often try to take the viewpoint of the participant and are more flexible and so on. So these are interviews. And that's sort of how far we got the last time. You know, I showed you videos about uh, a bad and a good interview. So how can we view interviews? And you know, maybe you thought, hang on, it's just about getting to know stuff. Yeah? But as you'll see in a second, there are two other purposes, or two other ways how you can use an interview. The first one, and that's sort of what is sometimes called interview as a tunnel. Interview as a tunnel. Here the idea is to find this, this gold nugget down there, you know, whatever you want to dig out. Yeah? You want to go down and you want to get that piece of information out of the individuals. You didn't know about it before, you want to get that piece of information. You really want to go down. It's like mining. You know? That's sort of where the tunnel idea comes into play. And here what you're interested in is really what does an interviewee say? You know, I'm the interviewer and I ask a question to you, you're the interviewee. So what do you say about a certain topic? Yeah, you think, okay, hang on, isn't that what, isn't that what the interviews are all about? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. But let's hang on for a moment. So when that is sort of the idea of an interview, you want to know what others say, it depends on you having good questions, yeah? So in question orders, interview behavior, all the things that we talked about in surveys, in questionnaires, remember, where we have to change the question order or we change the wording slightly and so on, and we got completely different results. All these things matter here too. Yeah? And actually they're much more amplified because it's much more a dynamic situation. Now imagine you're sitting there and I'm sitting on the other chair and we have a conversation. So obviously you're reacting to what I'm saying in some way or the other. And if somebody else would ask the same question, maybe you would react in a different way to that. And that's sort of like the kinds of problems that we have here. And this is kind of the kind of stuff you cannot avoid, but you need to be aware of it. So if you want to know something, you want to dig down and, and you know, mine that piece of information. If I go out and ask somebody, one problem is people want to be seen in a certain light. I sit down with you, we sit over coffee, you just want to look cool. You know, I ask you a bunch of questions and you say, uh, I want to impress this guy. And it's a very human thing, you know, social desirability kicks here in, often kicks in. Or when it's something that you might be embarrassed about, you're not going to tell me this, yeah, because you don't want to be seen in that light. That's a problem. If you want to get that piece of information, right? Because this prevents you from the interviewee is actually telling you the truth or telling you what, you what you want to know. What is another problem? Well, sometimes people think they, they know stuff, but actually they don't, they don't remember things correctly. So I ask you about your experience about, I don't know, 
going to a rock concert or whatnot, and maybe you just don't remember it anymore. Maybe you had too many teas or coffees. Yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you might not remember these kind of things. Uh, uh, or people remember stuff incorrectly. You know? If you want to get that piece of information, that truth, this is a problem. Maybe people just don't remember things correctly. Or maybe you talk to several people and maybe they remember things differently. Maybe you had an excellent time at a rock concert while another person remembered it as a very shitty time. So what do you take, what do you make out of this now? So that's sort of a problem when, when you see the interview just as a, as a tunnel, as a way of getting to some piece of information. Another thing, you know, there's this reactivity in the interview context. As I just talked about, when I ask you a question, you react to the way that I behave, the way that I look, the way I, my whole manners are. So there's a constant back and forth. And if you've been in an interview situation, it's totally like that. People can completely make you feel at ease or they can completely freak you out. And depending on that situation, you do completely, you say completely different things. You behave in a completely different way. So there is this reactivity and all these interviewer effects and problems with questions that we talked about in surveys, they are all massively amplified here. But it's something that we cannot really avoid. Uh, what is another problem? Well, maybe sometimes languages cannot express uh, what people really think or feel. If you want to get to that piece of information, maybe that person is unable to express it in their own words. Maybe they just don't know how to describe the situation. Yeah? Or maybe they just don't really, haven't really thought about it themselves, so whatever they tell you is sort of inaccurate in that sense, that you cannot get that piece of information. You cannot get that, that gold nugget that you, want to, that you want to get. So this is sort of interview as a tunnel. Maybe this is sort of how you've thought about it so far. But maybe now you see how, how you can use the interview in, in slightly different ways as well. And this is now where the second purpose of interviews come into play, um, which is sometimes called the interview as a topic. So what does that mean? Well, here, it's not so much about what the interviewee says. It's about how they say it. It's about how do they react to this whole situation. You know? So how do, they, how do they behave? And ultimately, it's not about what they say, but how does an interviewee say something? Are they afraid? Are they scared? Are they happy? Are they, are they enthusiastic when you talk with them about this rock concert, or when you talk with them about another experience that they had? Yeah? So it's more about the interview being an indirect source. So that means you don't want to get to that piece of information but you use that piece of, you have them talking about the piece of information to get to how interviewees talk about something. And, and then you can push this further, and actually this is sort of how, how nowadays, when people do qualitative interviews, they are, they are aware of this, and you have to be aware of this, that it's almost like an interaction. It's not that you are there and the interviewee is on the other side, it's like an interaction. And this is now uh, the, the third way how you can look at interviews. The interview is an interaction where we just sit obviously to each other. Yeah? And what you say depends on what I say. This is, a convers this is how conversations go. Conversations are not one-sided. Yeah? Conversations, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, different people are involved in this. And, you know, and last time I talked, it's actually important to build up this conversational style, this rapport. Because otherwise people don't talk to you. Otherwise, you don't get anything at all, or you just get a yes or no, and that's not what you want in such an interview. So the interview is an interaction, and here uh, you think about how does an interviewee react in interaction with what the interviewer says on what? So you don't just look at, I don't know, are they scared, are they afraid, are they happy, or so on, but you look at in response to what do they behave like that? So here, the interview is some, uh, there's, there's a constant construction going on, uh, um, and, and, and the interviewee and the interviewer are both very active. So these are the things that you need to be aware of when you, when you do an interview, that you are, by the very fact that you are there, that you're sitting opposite to the person who you're interviewing, by the very fact that your whole being is just there, in whatever way you are, you know, in my case, this is being a dude, yeah, uh, you are, you are already communicating. You are already part of that interaction. 
which then might affect what the person actually tells you. You need to be aware of this. Yeah? And actually, in qualitative research, people uh, write about that. Good qualitative research people write about how the whole situation looked like, how they interacted in it, or what, what their experiences were in it, in order to get, to, get, uh, to get that across how this interaction actually, actually happened. So that then you can actually make more sense of what the person said. So that's the interview as an interaction. But let me now move on. Now I want to move on to focus groups. Um, so after the interview, as like a, I don't know, you interview one person. Focus groups are basically uh, uh, the whole thing in a larger scale. Has any of you ever been in a focus group? Hands up. Yeah, some people. Okay, not that many. Well, a handful of people. Yeah. So um, focus groups. Actually, I was in a focus group. You know, I do all these kind of things for you. So I, had, I got this invitation for a focus group not too long ago from the university here. Uh, for some reason, I ended up on this email list. You know, they wanted to get international, international scholars or whatnot. And you know, I, I don't know, happened to move around a bit. So uh, I was on this, in this focus group about how UCD is seen globally. You know, they have this all often done by marketing folks. They love that idea. How does a brand come across? How is a product? Yeah. And then you sit there in groups and you talk about the product or about the brand and so on. And it's often very unstructured. You know, so you just sit around there and there's sometimes a moderator who tries to stay on top of it, but sometimes it just completely goes off. Yeah. So in that case, this focus group that I was in, you know, I went there because I wanted to know. I wanted to be part of a focus group one so that I can actually tell you. And, uh, and there, you know, people started talking about, we got some clues, you had to watch some videos about how some universities in the world present themselves like we said, the promotional videos, then we saw some promotional videos of UCD, and then we talked about it, and so on. Yeah. But there were a bunch of problems very apparent in that context that I'll talk about in a second. But here, first, let me have a definition of a focus group. It's basically a, a form of a qualitative research in which a group of people are asked about their perceptions, opinions, beliefs, and attitudes towards, oftentimes it's a product, but it can also be something else, you know, like a service, a concept, advertising idea, or packaging. Right? And, and often this actually happens in a marketing context. And uh, the questions are asked in an interactive group setting. So they are asked to the whole group, and then the, the idea is to have the group members discuss, talk about it. And you as a researcher then observe what they talk about and how they talk about these kind of things. Yeah. And often actually this is even how it looks like. You know, I don't know, traditionally there are some researchers behind the behind the, the window, yeah, I don't know, behind the mirror, and they just observe the whole thing, what's happening, and you let them ramble off. And sometimes that's exactly what it is. Sometimes it's a huge rambling off, where some people just uh, dominate that whole group, and that's one of the biggest problems with, uh, with focus groups. So what do they do? Well, focus groups, they, they, it's, it's a form of a group interview, basically. It's like, instead of just talking to one person, you talk to, I don't know, five, ten people that sit in the room, and then you even want to have them discuss things amongst each other. Yeah? And then you observe that. Usually there's uh, several participants, and then there's a moderator, you know, one person who tries to, I don't know, at least bring up the topics that the group should talk about, but, but otherwise the moderator should, should uh, put themselves in the background, because what you want to get is how the participants actually think about it. What do they say about it? Not what the moderator asks them to, to, to say or think about. So it's a discussion on a specific issue. Um, it's an interaction between group members. And, uh, and, and you're equally interested in not just what they say, but how they say it. You know, is there like a fierce battle about it? Is there like a conflict? One person says this, one other person says something else, and so on. When are they good? Um, well, they can help to... Uh, to uh, examine the way people construct and organize knowledge. So in our case, you know, where I was in this focus group, it was about, okay, how can we as UCD present ourselves internationally? What are we? Where are we so awesome? You know, we have to come up with all those attributes and so on. It's always like, seriously guys, just do good research, just do good teaching, man. This is sort of where you should put your efforts in it and not try to, try to sell things in, 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 in these ways. Uh, unfortunately, universities have to do this nowadays. But uh, we really, we're organizing, and, and the moderators, they observe like, how we as international people see the university, yeah? or what we think about it. 
They were also keen, probably they already had some ideas about what, what people would come up, but they wanted to know why are people thinking it like that? Or why do people think that this is sort of like the strengths and these are the weaknesses of, of, uh, of the university? And on the top of that, they wanted to, sometimes focus groups are used in, in brainstorming contexts where they want to get new ideas about, okay, what should we put on the, on the website at the end of the day? You know, like these marketing bullet points, or what, why, what are the five top things about UCD? They wanted to get an, a wide view on these kind of things. You know? So they elicited the uh, wide range of views through those uh, focus groups. So they can be helpful, you know? they can be helpful, there can be things bubbling up. But, uh, you know, as I said, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical towards focus groups as well. Uh, partly because this can completely derail. You know, this can completely go off board. And sometimes you see that happening. That, uh, that then, in those groups, they talk about whatever. And, and even uh, uh, more often, it's because of single individuals in that group. So in the case of this focus group where I was in about uh, why you see so great, uh, I always, for whatever reason, I always end up with my personal nemesis, a lecturer in another school. I shall not mention it. And, uh, but for whatever reason, we kind of kick the same boxes. You know, we're sort of like relatively young, we're sort of like international background and things like that. And we sort of recently moved to UCD. So, so somehow, I don't know, we end up in the same email list. But um, she's American. You know? And uh, I have a lot of great American friends. Seriously, I lived in America for a while. Uh, um, so nothing about Americans, but she's just very loud. She's just very loud and uh, very pushy and very forthcoming in a way, you know, where sometimes I just think, Amber, just shut the fuck up. <laughs> just shut your mouth. Let us talk about this here and seriously take a step back. Yeah? And, um, but this situation, that can happen in focus groups very easily. There are five, six people and one person is very dominating and, and then this person just completely takes over the whole thing. And then other people like me, I'm just sitting there and someone is just giving up. You know, I just think about, okay, what else am I going to do today? I, don't, I, I completely disconnect from this group. So you want to, you want to avoid that, but that's sort of like a big problem. Um, but even then, if you kind of collect data like that, it's incredibly difficult to analyze. What do you do with these kind of things? It's like, and seriously, when you put a bunch of academics together, it doesn't necessarily mean that we come up with something, something very clear and straightforward. So sometimes it's like a crazy rambling. Yeah. And, uh, and then what do you do with that? There's no structure in the thoughts or in the things that come up. Or maybe there's some structure for some people but not for others. And so. so it's incredibly difficult to organize these things. And sometimes then what you see, actually yesterday was another setting like that, you know, then you have like a college meeting where there's a board and then you get little, little, little post-its and then you write something on the post-its and then you put it on this board or on that board. And some of these little exercises that uh, they do in, 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 in management sometimes, to organize these thoughts, yeah? to organize the things that bubble up in these focus groups. But it's very difficult to analyze. You know, it's a different story from just having a survey where everybody asks the same questions. At the end of the day, you have a data set, and you can clearly say, I don't know, that many people said yes, and that many people said no. Yeah? It's a, this is much a, a different way of handling it then. Because then, well, I don't know how you organize it afterwards. Yeah? It can be very time consuming. Uh, also, there's sometimes a tendency for more agreement than disagreement in discussions. It's just a human natural thing. We don't like to, like to be shy away from, from conflicts often, uh, more than we, than, we, than we look for it. Uh, and uh, sometimes people can feel uncomfortable. For example, like I am when I meet my personal nemesis. So these are sort of like limitations of focus groups. You know? They can be very useful sometimes, but Again, like keep in mind that there are these limitations out there. And that's sort of like with all these research methods that I'm telling you about here. You know, it's not that there's one thing that kind of solves it all. They have their strengths and their weaknesses. And how do you choose? Well, it really depends on your question. This is where we are at the beginning of this whole lecture. Think about what your question is and how are you going to best answer your question. And then everything else follows from this. Even the whole thing, whether you're going to go down a quantitative or qualitative approach, follows from this. Okay, but so much about focus groups. Let me now move on and talk about ethnography. So this is sort of like a natural progression to some, in some degrees. 
we have like a one-to-one -one interview. I sit down and we have a conversation. Then focus group, there are many people and they have a conversation. And ethnography is, is going even further, like immersing yourself as a researcher in the whole thing. We used to talk, we used to call this participant observation, but nowadays it involves much more than just participant observation, than just sitting there and observing people, although it's a big part of it. But uh, interviews are equally a part of it, or even participating and doing other things with the members in there. So ethnographies. Let me talk about ethnographies. And in this context, I want to talk first, very briefly, you know, these are not major, major points, uh, about what ethnography is, then about getting access, which is a very important issue with whole ethnographies, field notes, then I talk a little bit about covert and overt ethnographies, and finally about the issue of exclusion. Okay, so what are ethnographies? Well, let me give you a definition first, and then I'll explain it a little more, and I have more examples for it. Uh, ethnography is a data collection technique that requires the researcher to be present, involved in, and record the routine activities with people in the field settings. The idea is to identify the rules and meanings that govern relationships and actions in the setting. Example. So a good friend of mine, and uh, a colleague, James Dainsley, uh, he, he actually studied, for his PhD, he studied how, how do youth gangs recruit new members. He looked at that in London. Uh, so what he did, he basically embedded himself for two years in a youth gang. So not just going out and putting graffiti at the wall, which is a cool experiment anyway, you know, I talked about it a while back. But this guy was actually hanging out with this youth gang for two years. He became part of the youth gang. And they did some serious crime. But the idea is that he sort of immerses himself in this group, in this setting, in this case the youth gang, to then understand how does this youth gang work? And then to learn how do they actually recruit new members. He wrote a beautiful book about it. It's called How Gangs Work. You know, and it was about this whole process of seeing how the gang operates, how people get into the gang, and how the gang functions. You know? And actually, uh, we then ended up working together on this setting a little bit. You know, I'm sort of like, I mostly do social network analysis. So we then combined his ethnography with my network analysis by looking at. Um, co-offending data, or basically data from, from CCTV cameras that the police collected about this youth gang, about who was co-offending with whom, or who was hanging out with whom. And then we studied the network of, in this gang, the structure of this gang. But that was sort of like a side note where I came into, where I came into play. You know, James did this very interesting ethnography, like really immersing himself. And, uh, and the youth gang is just one example. You know, people, traditionally these things came from anthropology. Now, where people went out to, I don't know, an unknown tribe somewhere in the Amazon or somewhere, I don't know, in, in the Africa, that's sort of originally where, where this technique was developed. And then they basically lived with that tribe for a year to see how, how does this tribe work? Who are the important people? What are the things that govern people's lives? That's to, to experience it, to be there. And the whole point of it is, or that's sort of when you talk to an anthropologist uh, uh, or with, with good ethnographers and you tell them that you kind of went out and you talked with somebody for an afternoon or you spent a week with them, they say, you don't know anything. They say you need to be there for a long period of time. Why? Because only then people actually really reveal their true self to you. Then you actually see how their life goes. It's not that they kind of set up a show for you as a researcher. Because keep in mind, as a researcher, you cannot really or well, this is sort of like where we then come talk about covert and overt ethnographies. As a researcher, it's actually incredibly difficult and most often also very unethical to, to not tell people that you are the researcher. Oftentimes, it's just obvious. You know, my friend James, I don't know, the guy did his PhD, he's two meters tall, he's black, he's, 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 he's practically an albino, he's completely, I don't know, completely uh, white, bold, yeah? um, and he went into this black youth gang in East London. So this guy was obviously, obviously sticking out. The thing why it worked is that he was so sticking out that the guys in the youth gang already thought, oh, this is our mascot. Let's take this guy along with us. Yeah. But these are sort of the, the, the issues that you have when you, when you do ethnography. So it was developed originally in anthropology, but then nowadays people, people do interesting ethnographies 
in different settings. So another friend of mine, he did a, in a, in a ethnographic study on how the United Nations work. Yeah? So he basically, he did this internship, or that was sort of like his, his mock setup in a way. But then he kind of, uh, kind of looked at how do people talk with each other, how is the communication going and so on. So it's less, it's less limited or people became moved away from, from just looking at some uh, isolated tribes somewhere in the world. But nowadays you can do ethnographic studies about a whole bunch of things. You can do ethnographic studies, and some interesting people did that, about um, uh, football hooligans. Uh, so they join the football hooligans and go with them to the matches and actually see what's happening there. How, what's going on? How does this actually work? So all sorts of things, but I have some more examples later on. So um, in ethnographies, the focus is usually a single setting or group. You know, something like, I don't know, this particular youth game that my friend James was studying. Um, of relatively small scale, simply because you cannot go large scale with this. Yeah? How can you embed yourself in, in tons of uh, youth gangs for a prolonged period of time? It's just impossible. Uh, sometimes it's, you even focus on a particular individual. And the analysis of data involves interpretation of the meanings and functions of human actions and mainly takes the form of verbal descriptions. So it's a lot about describing things. And maybe now you see where from the philosophy of science point of view, this is a different way of doing research. Now, I told you in the beginning, I don't know what I hope to do, I try to explain things. With ethnographies, it's actually more describing things. This can be very important to explain things. I think in order to do a good explanation, you need to have a very good description to begin with. Yeah? Otherwise, what are you going to explain? Otherwise, you're just completely out of the nowhere, in a way. But um, not to say, well, with ethnographers, sometimes you can you can also try to explain things and understand things. But sometimes people don't understand things themselves. Sometimes people just do certain things. And if you as a researcher ask them uh, why they're doing it, they can't tell you because they didn't know themselves. They are not aware of social constraints. And this is sort of how our life often goes. You know, there are social constraints that you are not aware of. It's crazy how structured the social world is. Look at your friends, who your friends are. Look at sort of your social background. Look at the occupations of your parents. Look at the occupations of your aunts and uncles. All these kind of things affect your life in a huge, huge way. In a way that you're not even aware of. You think you, you can do whatever you want, but your thinking is being pre-structured through that. Because, I don't know, by the way you grow up, you're being exposed to certain people. You know? So for example, in my family, my dad was a teacher. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because it was sort of like the thing that I could relate with in a certain way. There was no medical doctor in my family, so I had no idea about that job. So it didn't even cross my mind to go into that field. Yeah. So this is sort of how our lives are much more structured than we, than we think we are. And we think we are in control of things, but actually a uh, uh, social structure predetermines a lot of the things in our life. But you know, coming back to ethnography, so it's really about immersing yourself in this one setting. Essentially, it's about opening up your eyes. So, I have a little video about what an ethnography is. So, let's watch this and uh, just listen to folks that actually did an ethnography. It's a bunch of researchers and they did an ethnographic studies in the Balkans. And uh, there you see what, what they think what ethnography is. sociology, and part investigative journalism. This is what it means to us. In the simplest terms, ethnography is a picture or a portrait of a group of people. It's doing our best to describe something about a culture from the perspective of those inside the culture. The idea is to join a conversation already taking place and to learn what's important to people what they value, and what they naturally talk about. It's letting people tell us who they are. But unlike other forms of research, ethnography admits our own cultural perspectives. For example, we were Americans in a Balkan space. 
Protestants in an Orthodox space, and conflict sheltered in a conflict ridden space. In this way, ethnography functions not only as a description of a foreign culture, but also as a commentary on our culture. It's only through our interaction with others that we discover our own biases, our own identities, and our own collective culture. Ethnography involves field work, which necessitates interaction. We couldn't be afraid to get involved, to get our hands dirty. Several data collection methods were used, including outside research, observation, and interviews. In this way, we attempt to corroborate our findings in different ways. Ethnography is always of interest. Ethnography is recognizing that everyone has a story. We have to see people as more than just data informants. It means really getting to know people. It's learning how to communicate with people who are different than us and seeking to understand them through being a good listener, asking open-ended questions, and letting whomever we are talking to direct the conversation. We interviewed in pairs, and so while one person asked a question and engaged the interviewee, the other person took notes. In order to preserve the voices of our interviewees, we tried to write down everything we heard, to capture every word, even if it seemed trivial or insignificant at the moment. After interviewing for at least four hours a day, we typed up everything we'd written for the next several hours, which takes forever, by the way. Ethnography is writing and writing and writing. Then we went back and read everything we typed and tried to locate emergent themes. Once a week, we'd all meet together to discuss patterns and themes, bounce ideas off one another. Okay, let me um, stop here because I want to talk about some other things as well. So there you already got a feeling for how, how uh, what people do. You know, they interview in pairs, they kind of observe the whole thing, they really try to get the whole, but, but at the same time being very much aware of their own presence and the whole thing. Um, I want to show you another thing, you know, uh, I told you a little bit about, uh, about this study that my friend James did, you know, about this youth gang. It's actually another very famous study by James Patrick, a Glasgow gang observe observed, the guy uh, embedded himself in a, in a gang as well, and uh, as it turned out, the gang was pretty, pretty violent, yeah, it's pretty violent, so they started to beat people up, they started to put things on fire, they started to steal things, what do you do as a research, yeah. do, you, uh, do you participate in this, you want to have participant observation, right, you want to, want to know how it all goes, but now you see ethical issues are a big concern here in this context. Yeah? So, um, you know, my friend James, he was telling me this other story, which is sort of freaky, you know, you kind of, with this youth gang, he met with those guys in the middle of the night on this deserted parking lot, he knows there are weapons in the, in the trunk and things like that. So, all the, so, how do you deal with that as a researcher? Yeah? So, ethical issues are, are huge. Another example, another famous study by Irving Goffman, maybe you came across him, so Irving Goffman, he was basically studying asylums, mental health institutions. You know, this was sort of like at the early, I don't know, a long time ago, uh, at the early part of the 20th century or then in the middle of it. And uh, he basically, he embedded himself in this, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, mental health institution as, you no, know, he, for, for the outside world, he was like a, I don't know, like a physical therapy assistant or something like that. So he, he actually got a job in there. But what he actually did, he observed the whole thing, how it actually works. And uh, his major finding was uh, that uh, the mental health institution worked like a, like a total institution. That's how he called it. It was like he compared it to monasteries or to prisons. It was almost like so, so conservative, so detached from the real world. And, and ultimately, you know, he said, he put, one of his findings was that, you know, that this total institution didn't help people, but actually made things worse because people were so detached from, from the world. But you know, nobody else, uh, except like his, his immediate boss, knew that Goffman was actually a, a researcher in this. Yeah? But there you again see now this difference that we have um, between covert and overt uh, research. Well, first of all, you need to get access to the whole thing. How do you get access to that, yeah? to, to the people that you study? Or in this case, 
how do you become a member of a youth gang? Yeah? This is actually not that easy to, to get to that point. So in a democracy, you spend a lot of time getting access to something. And sometimes, you know, they're sort of straightforward ways. So I don't know, famous people thought about how McDonald's works. Yeah? How, I don't know, the, how the labor situation is in that country. So they get a job there. Or another sociologist, Louis Vacon, now at Berkeley, he wrote this interesting book, Body and Mind. He joined the boxing club. He was this tiny little guy. Yeah? He joined this boxing club and went through the whole thing. So you basically do what your participants do. Well, that's sort of like the idea to immerse yourself, to get you go where the participants are instead of just bringing them in, right? which is the opposite of a laboratory environment, you know, when you have the participants bring in. You go to where your participants are. But it's not always that difficult. Uh, it's always not, it's always not, that, not that easy to, to get access uh, to, to the groups that you're studying. So you hang around, you shadow them, you engage in general conversations with them, and so on. But you require permission for that. And how do you get there? So in the case of, of James, you know, my friend, he actually, he had a sponsor. He, through some serious work, he got, earned the trust of one person in the gang who then took him along. You know, and then introduced him to the boss of the gang, and then, you know, and then the boss was checking him out for a while. And then at some point he realized, okay, this guy is harmless. Uh, they even felt, oh, that's cool, let's have this guy write his green sheet thesis about us. Yeah. And then they kind of took him along. But he had to go through a series of these dodgy parking lots in the middle of the night. Yeah. Okay. Um, you need to get access stuff, you write field notes, but let me quickly talk about this. You know, covert ethnography uh, is basically where your participants don't know that you are a researcher. People used to do this a lot. Nowadays, this is much more problematic, and mostly for ethical reasons. Yeah, because you would fool people. You cannot really fool people. And nowadays, this is, this is a no-no in research, to fool people. So you need to find some other way around. But here the idea is that you are sort of like uh, uh, em embedding yourself, and people, people don't really know uh, that you are not part of that. The contrast to that is overt ethnographies. In overt ethnographies, people know that you are the researcher, and you kind of try to adopt that being the fly of the wall attitude. Like you sit there and you just try to make yourself as less uh, intrusive as possible and observe what the others are doing. Yeah? And you hope that actually your own present is not going, presence is not going to change what, what they are doing. But that's sort of like overt, uh, co uh, covert and overt ethnographies. There are a bunch of other terms you know, that I had here, gatekeepers, key informants, and so on. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that a little more. The big point that you need to keep in mind, you know, as fascinating as those things are, I think they're really fascinating. You cannot generalize from it. That's another thing that you need to keep in mind. Right? But you learn other things. You dig deep. Yeah? Something that you probably couldn't do in a large-scale survey on the, whole, on the general population in Ireland. In a way. So you have different perspectives for different things. And this generalization part, this is sort of where we are picking up next week. That's basically where something comes into play. And that's something that Travis is going to start. So, so do the reading yeah? for next week. This is for the whole next week on something and check out the exam preparation guides that I put on Blackboard. It really helps. Okay, thanks guys.